morning, everyone. Thank you, music team. What incredible words uh, to end our time of worship with. Really love that song. You guys did it so well. Um, but if you are, are visiting, you are visiting us on part two of a four-part series called Found. We started last week. And what we're looking at is the four ways or four ways that God reveals himself to us. We started last week with um, how God reveals himself to us through creation. And this morning we're going to look at how God reveals himself to us through his word. But I want to start by telling you a quote from a guy called Ricky Gervais. Do you know who he is? He is a comedian. He created uh, that program called The Office. He is well known for being uh, quite irreverent. There's no topic that's off the cards for him. He's also well known for his uh, stance of being an atheist. And he was talking to, to someone who uh, said they were a Christian and asked him why, they, why he doesn't believe in God. And this was his response. You can put that first slide up. He said, basically, you, de you deny one less God than I do. You don't believe in 2,999 gods, and I don't believe in just one more. Apparently, I did some researches. It is believed that there's about 3,000 gods with a small g that mankind has worshipped or worships. And essentially, what Ricky Gervais is saying is that you and I are just as big an atheist as he is. We just don't believe in one more God. And what he's saying is that all of these gods, these 3,000 gods, including the God of the Bible, are just man-made and uh, are not worth believing in. And that is the argument that he presents and something that I want to address this morning. So I went and I had a look and I searched for these 3,000 gods that Ricky Gervais talks about. And I want to tell you that after reading them, I read about the Hindu gods, and I read about the Greek gods, and I read about the gods of the Polynesian islands and of different islands. And the sense that I got when I walked away was I felt incredibly dirty inside because I noticed two themes. I wanted to show you some of these gods, but as I went through them, I just went, yep, that's not appropriate for church. <laughs> that's not appropriate for church. The two themes were sex and violence, and not just any type of of sex, the worst perversion you can imagine. There were gods of all of these things that portrayed this to humans, and the worst type of violence that you could imagine. And I really struggled to find a god that I could present to you, but I did find two. So I'm going to show you two of these 3,000 gods that Ricky Gervais talks about. The first one, you can put his picture up. This guy is Baron Samedi. He comes from Haiti, and I'm going to read a bit about him. Baron Samedi is a voodoo god of the dead who is generally associ associated with obscenity, chaos, debauchery, and intoxication. Perhaps the weirdest thing about this god is his appearance. He is a reanimated skeleton who wears sunglasses, a top hat, and a tuxedo. Samedi also sports cotton nasal plugs, much like a corpse preparing for burial. This is his job. His job is to greet the dead when they die before leading them to the underworld. He also digs their graves and ensures their corpses rot in the ground to prevent them from returning as a zombie. If you find you are a zombie walking around earth, you have this guy to blame because he didn't do the one job he was supposed to do. In his spare time, this sounds like a dating profile. This is what he enjoys to do in his spare time. Samedi loves drinking rum, smoking cigars, chasing women, and swearing profusely. However, he is also a curer of disease and protector from death, as only he can decide when a person crosses into the afterlife. How would you like to worship this guy? How would you like it if this guy stood between you and uh, the eternity and uh, the underworld? And uh, what do you think disciples of this guy look like? People who follow this guy, what do you think their lives look like? One more God. Cronus, you can put him up. This is Cronus, he's a Greek god. The first two thirds of his story I couldn't read to you because it was too disturbing for church. But there was a prophecy that one of his children would rise up against him and overthrow him. So this is what it, what it says. As a paranoid lunatic, Cronus decided to eat his children as they were born to prevent this prophecy from happening. 
So as soon as he had a child, he would eat them. However, Rhea and Gaia hid baby Zeus, giving Cronus a rock wrapped in baby's clothes to eat instead. The unhinged cannibal ate the rock, and Zeus, and Zeus grew up to fulfill the prophecy. Cronus was thrown into uh, Tartus, although he may have been released to rule over a distant land. Indeed, the Romans later adopted him as the god Saturn. How would you like to worship this baby-eating lunatic? Um, and this, this is, these are the gods that Ricky Gervais says are comparable to the God of the Bible. He says they're all one and the same. There's no difference between them. So how would I prove, I'm glad you took that photo off because you don't want to hang around that picture too long. How would I prove to Ricky or anyone here today who has a similar view that uh, the God of the Bible is just like one of these other man-made created gods? Well, if there was one that stood out, it would have to have something of a mark of divinity upon it. There would have to be something beyond the realm of mankind, something miraculous about it. The Oxford definition of a miracle, which will come up now, is an extraordinary and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore attributed to a divine agency. And I love the example that they use, the miracle of rising from the grave. If I could show you a miracle today, would you then believe that this is the one God that stands out above all of the other gods? And before I do that, I want to show you a miracle today, so prepare yourself for that. But before we get there, I want to say that you might think that a miracle would be enough, but history and the Bible itself tells us that miracles are actually not enough. In Mark 3, verses 1 to 6, Jesus goes, it says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. What a response. Imagine if we called for someone who was sick today and miraculously healed in front of you and you leave and your heart is saying, man, let's go and kill Jesus. Let's go and refute what he's talking about. It shows you how stubborn the heart of man can be, that even a miracle in front of their own eyes is just not good enough. If you read on later, verse 22, they say to Jesus, it's only by the power of Satan that you are able to drive out demons. They come up with all sorts of excuses to try and prove that God is not who he says he is. Exodus 32, if you had to go read, God has just taken the Israelites over out of Egypt and over the Red Sea, he's destroyed the enemies that were chasing them. And uh, what happens is the first chance they get, they create a golden calf. Despite seeing all of the miraculous things God has done. In John 11, verses 47 to 48, Jesus has just healed Lazarus. And the people in the town are talking about it. It's all they can talk about. And uh, they go and they tell the chief priests what God has done. So verse 47, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And from that moment on, they set out to plot uh, to kill and to uh, eradicate Jesus. Isn't it an, Im an amazing response? God revealing himself on earth through the miraculous and the hearts of many men uh, plot to, to kill God because it cuts across what they want to do. So why are miracles often not enough for the stubbornness of man's heart? Well, in Mark 8, verse 34 to 35, it says this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever believes to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Many people somewhere down in their hearts know that if they allow themselves to believe 
that the Bible and the God of the Bible is true, that that has dramatic uh, implications for their lives. It means that they have to step off of the throne of their lives, and they have to lay down their life to serve the one true king. And as a result of an unwillingness to do that, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, it says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Jesus says, um, he says this thing, and it's mentioned in Isaiah and in Revelation, and it's along the lines of, he who has an ear, let him hear. The words of God go out throughout creation and throughout mankind, and it's up to us to, to decide, are we going to open our ears to what God is saying, or are, is the stubbornness of our hearts going to prevent those words getting through? I once saw an uh, atheist debating a believer, and the believer said to him, if Jesus himself appeared before you and you felt the, the holes in his hands, would you then believe? And the atheist said, no, then I would say that uh, all that's happening is I'm having a hallucination. My mind is playing tricks on me. Essentially, there is nothing on this earth that God could ever do to convince me because I've decided that he doesn't exist because I want to continue to be the king on the throne of my life. So this thing about he who has an ear, let him hear, is a commentary that I want to read a portion to you. It says, who is he who has ears? The simple answer, all people who have been, who, or, uh, been or are being given the words of God. Like the parable's original audience, we must also listen up, pay close attention. Jesus' simple request is that we use our God-given faculties, eyes to see, ears to hear, to tune into His words. For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Seeking God's truth takes energy and focus. It takes a willingness to be challenged and changed. While the way of God's truth is not the most convenient or fun path to take, we can be assured that it is the best one. And so he bids us come. It's an invitation to be found by God that goes out to us. So who wants to see a miracle this morning? Who wants to see a miracle right now? You've been staring at one the whole time that I've been talking. Not me, but this. This is a miracle. And I know you're going, oh, that's lame. What a trick. He tricked us. We want to see a real miracle. All I'm asking is just give me a chance this morning. I want to prove to you this morning that this, this is one of the greatest miracles, if not the greatest miracle that you will see or hold and uh, be able to read and touch and taste in your lifetime. You see, we need to prove that of those 3,000 gods, that there is something beyond the creativity of man that marks the God that we serve, the God of the Bible. And 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So God has breathed his life through the humans who wrote down the books of the Bible. Um, so the only words I think that God wrote directly are the Ten Commandments. But other than that, God spoke to men uh, who penned and wrote down his words. 600 times in the Old Testament, it, it says God said. Another 400 times uh, in the King James, it says, thus, thus saith the Lord. And we see Jesus quoting the Old Testament um, and making use, uh, pulling through the things of the Old Testament into the New. So you might be uh, easily led to believe that this is a book, but this is not a book. This is a library of books written by 40, uh, about 40 authors, some of whom we know, some we don't, and written over 1,500 years. So try and get that into your brain. If I said to you, you need to write something, but you need to get 40 people to write it, and you've got 1,500 years to write it, and it must all make cohesive sense at the end, and these people mustn't necessarily know that they're writing or, or what the next person is going to write. It must all just be divinely inspired. Do you think you'd be able to do that? In the Old Testament, there are 39 books written over 1,100 years, and then there's this 400-year gap. We often forget that between the Old and the New Testament. 400 years is a long time. To give you some context, 200 years ago, the 1820 settlers 
had just arrived uh, in South Africa. That's only 200 years. 200 years before that, uh, the first Dutch ship had, uh, was about four or five years away from crash landing in, uh, in uh, Cape Town, the Bay of Good Hope. A lot can happen in 400 years. And this book that spans 1,500 years is written by fishermen, by physicians, by shepherds, by kings. And uh, there was uh, two men, Chris Harrison and Christoph Romhild. In 2007, one of the things that makes the Bible unique, and there's no book on the face of the earth that can do this, is the Bible was the first hyperlink book. You know what a hyperlink is? If you're reading something on your computer and there's a word and you click on it, then it takes you to another spot. Well, the Bible has almost 64,000 cross-references over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. There's 63,779 cross-references. So you can put that next picture that I have. This is hard to see, but what you're looking at is an absolute miracle. So these things at the bottom here are chapters of the Bible, and their length depends on how long the chapters are. You can spot Psalm 119 there. <laughs> because it's a very long chapter. And all of these different lines, all of this rainbow colors is cross-referencing uh, verses in the Bible and chapters in the Bible uh, to one another. It's absolutely incredible. There's nothing on the face of the earth that even comes close to what you see uh, in front of you. What you are looking at is a true miracle. And just to give you a, an idea of how immense this miracle is, there's about 351 prophecies in the Old Testament that span over that 400-year period into the New Testament. And those prophecies are about Jesus. I've got a document. If you want it, I can give you each and every single one of those prophecies. And there was a mathematician and a scientist called um, Peter Stoner. You can put his, the next slide up. He was chairman of mathematics and science at Pasadena City College and Westmont, uh, Westmont College. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to study the probability that one man like Jesus could fulfill all of those Old Testament prophecies. And all of them have been fulfilled except the ones that speak of his second coming. Uh, so what he did was he got 600 students to help him. And it took a number of months. And once they were finished, they submitted their findings to the National American Science Council. And what they said is that this is not just accurate, but it's conservative. Uh, the probability that I'm going to show you that this would happen. So they started with eight prophecies about Jesus. You can put the next slide up. These are the eight prophecies. I'll read them for you that Christ was to be born in Bethlehem, that was out of Micah 5.2, that Christ is to be preceded by a messenger, Isaiah 43, Malachi 3.1. And uh, these are different people. Um, uh, I went and looked, I think it's Micah or Malachi versus Isaiah. There's 300 years difference between them. Um, third, that Christ was to enter Jerusalem on a, doc on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Christ would be betrayed by a friend. Uh, the Psalms mention that. Christ to be sold for 30 pieces of silver, again in Zechariah. The money for which Christ is sold to be thrown to the potter in God's house. There's the reference there. Christ to be silent before his executioners in Isaiah. And Christ to be executed by crucifixion as a thief. And there's a few references there. Now, what is the probability that just eight of those 300 things could happen? Uh, you can put up the next slide. They worked out that just for eight prophecies, it's a bit small, but I'll read it, is 10 to the power of 17, which is 10 and then 17 zeros. If you go to 16 prophecies, it's 10 to the power of 45, 48 prophecies, 10 to the power of 157. So that means absolutely nothing to us. So I mentioned something similar last week, but, but just to help give us some perspective, the probability that eight of those prophecies would be true, this is how they explain it. This is a dollar coin from America. It's an American dollar coin. With the exchange rate, I only had to sell one kidney to buy this one American dollar coin. And they said that if you took the state of Texas, which I looked up, Texas is just a little bit bigger than half of South Africa. 
You took the, t- the state of Texas and you covered it in these little coins two feet deep. And you put a man in a helicopter and you marked one of these coins and he flew across the state of Texas and he had to find that one coin and you randomly selected one coin. That is 10 to the power of 17. That is the probability that one man could accomplish eight of the prophecies. And we see that Jesus has accomplished all of those prophecies came through in Jesus. It's actually beyond our minds to consider and grasp. I can't even explain that 10 to the power 157. They tried. I'm not going to try. It's just too much. And they've done some studies about psychics and even guys like Nostradamus. And they said their accuracy rate in predicting the future is 8%. 92% of the time they get it wrong. And uh, yet we see this, this thing, this Bible that predicts these things in such an incredibly accurate way. Just a few more things. I want to give you some scientific evidence that distinguishes the Bible and the Word of God apart from these other things. Um, One of them is hygiene. Uh, uh, One of the articles I found was about Moses, the microbiologist. If you've ever read your Bible, you'll get to Leviticus, and uh, you'll realize there's some heavy reading there because there's instructions on what to eat, what to wear. There's instructions on where to go to the bathroom. There's instructions on what to do if you have an open wound and a boil and a sore. And someone asks you, how was your quiet time this morning? And you say, man, I was so blessed. I learned about open sores and, and uh, what I should do about them. But uh, the nation of Israel grew uh, in incredible ways and survived in incredible ways uh, because they, they didn't realize it, but there was an understanding that God had about germs and all of these laws were to protect them and set them apart. And the other nations had no understanding of those kind of things. In fact, to such a degree that when the black plague hit and the millions of people died, there were Jews who were practicing their faith and uh, their, the hygiene that they observed because of these laws that God had given them um, set them apart and they weren't dying at the same rates as other people. And what happened is people accused them of starting the plague. And there was uh, a lot of persecution against the Jews uh, because people were noticing that they weren't dying. Um, So the Bible, before anyone was aware of any of this, is given uh, scientific credibility. There's this amazing thing that I really uh, am going to enjoy sharing with you that I discovered while I was doing research. Um, It's about 12 precious stones. So there are two types of precious stones when you think about diamonds and gems. One is isotropic, and one is anisotropic. So what isotropic means is that if you shine pure light into isotropic gems, they reflect nothing. All you see is a a black image. And uh, guess what diamonds are? Diamonds are isotropic. If you shine uh, perfect light, pure light into diamonds, you see nothing. Then there are other types of gems, Uh, and isotropic gems, if you shine pure light into them, they reflect, they come alive, they reflect this beautiful spectrum of all sorts of uh, incredible light. And we've only discovered this recently when scientists discovered cross-polarized light, which is a pure form of light that they could shine onto these diamonds. So this is a fairly new discovery. In the book of Revelation, The Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem where there is no sun and there is no moon because God is the source of light. He is the source of pure light. And this new Jerusalem is built on the foundations of 12 stones. And if you took a wild guess, would you say that those stones are isotropic, that when the pure light of God hits them, they reflect nothing but darkness? Or would you say that those pure stones are anisotropic, that they are the few stones that when the light of God hits them, they're going to reflect beautiful radiant color? Uh, You can put the next slide up. These are the 12 stones that the New Jerusalem is built on, and that's what they look like when you hit them with pure light. You can put the next slide up. Um, These are the isotropic ones that when you shine pure light on them, they just go black and they just go gray. The book of Revelation was written in 96 AD. That's a very long time ago. 
how did that guy know when he wrote that book and he described the pure light of God, how did he know that the, the gems that we mention in heaven would be anisotropic and not isotropic? If it was me, I would have put diamonds in there. Uh, but all the ladies, your fancy diamonds, you're not taking them with you because they won't reflect anything when you get to heaven one day. But isn't it amazing that there's, and this, this is, I've, I've had to leave so much stuff out. There's so many incredible examples of how the Bible is scientifically accurate long before the science was there to understand it. Um, so the next slide, I'm not going to go through this, but the fact that life is in the blood, uh, the seas and the paths and the boundaries, even the fact that air has weight, the fact that air actually has weight is a relatively new discovery. However, the Bible discussed the weight of air in Job, and some people believe Job is the, the earliest book in the Bible. In verse 28, 25, it says, When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the, water by, uh, the waters by measure. And the exact order of, of events in the origin of all things, all of these things, the earth as the raw material of human bodies, rainwater returning to its source, they all mention in the Bible hundreds, thousands of years before mankind ever discovers them. I'm going to move as quickly as I can. So that's scientific evidence that the Word of God stands above any other word. Uh, there's uh, textual evidence, so you can read this with me. According to scholar F.F. F. Bruce, we have nine or ten good copies of Caesar's Gaelic Wars. These are all historical documents upon which we base our understanding of history. Twenty copies of Livy's Roman history, two copies of Tacitus uh, annals and eight copies of, um, I don't know how to pronounce that, Thyadide's history. The most document, documented secular work from antiquity is Homer's Iliad with 643 copies. So the amount of copies that you have of an old text gives weight to how credible it is. And the very best that history can offer is 643. How many copies of the New Testament do you think there are? can put up the next slide. But there are roughly 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, making this collection of 26 books the most highly documented book in the ancient world. Um, there is nothing that comes close uh, to uh, the New Testament documents that we find. So that's the number of copies. Another thing is the date of copies. Like, for example, um, the, the Gaelic Wars, uh, when were they written after the events that transpired? Uh, so the next slide you can bring up. Generally speaking, the older the manuscript copies are, uh, the better. Uh, sorry, I've, this is the age of them. The Gaelic wards, wars were written 900 years after Caesar. So the best evidence that we have for Caesar was written 900 years after he died. Tacitus was 800. There are only two copies. And 1,000 years later, Homer's Iliad was 1,000 years later later. So how long do you think the New Testament scriptures were written after uh, the death of Jesus? Next slide says this, less than 200 years, with some about 100 years, and there's one fragment surviving within a generation of its authorship. There's a, a scrap of papyrus no more than 40 years after the original was written, and it contains John 18 verse 31 to 33 and 37 to 38. No other book from the ancient world has as small a gap between composition and earliest manuscript copies as the New Testament. One more that I'm going to give you. I know for some of you this feels like a bit of a lecture, but hang, hang in there with me, please. We're going somewhere. The next one is the accuracy of the copies. Um, the New Testament is the most accurately copied book from the ancient world. Textual scholars Westcott and Hort estimate the accuracy of the copies to be 98.33% with no differences affecting the article of faith. And what they mean is that some copies it says Jesus Christ, other copies it says Christ Jesus. That small 1% difference is made up of differences that don't affect anything that we believe or anything that is crucially important uh, to the faith that we believe. So the number of copies, the date of copies, the accuracy of copies. If you believe in Julius Caesar and you don't believe that Jesus rose and died from the dead, then you are a hypocrite because you are not applying the same standards to both things. 
Last one, Archaeolog archaeological evidence. Noted archaeologist Nelson, I can't read his surname either, uh, he states, as a matter of fact, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever uh, controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements made in the Bible. There's the Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, the fall of Jericho, King David, and the Syrian captivity as examples. I haven't even got time to speak to you about the societal impact that the Bible has made on civilization as we know it. We don't even have time to go through all of our personal stories of the, the, how the Bible has impacted and changed millions and millions of lives throughout the generation, uh, throughout the history of mankind. So the conclusion that we have to come to is that God's word is a miracle. It is something that no man could conceptualize or even begin to create. That the word of God is a sure foundation that stands head and shoulders above any other uh, power or principality, above any other God or earthly king or created uh, God that man has come up with. That the Bible and the word of God has stood the test of time. That many have set out to discredit the Bible and have been converted themselves. And that the only way to discredit or rule out the power of the word of God or its divine nature is to abandon all reason whatsoever. You cannot look at the weight of evidence and say that the word of God is not divinely inspired, that there is only one God, that his name is King Jesus, that he died on a cross for you and me so that we can be set free. And in the light of all of that, we read Isaiah 55, which is an invitation to the thirsty. It says, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. Remember I spoke about ye who has an ear, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the riches of fair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon them. There is nothing that compares to our God and there is nothing that compares to the word of God that he spoke into being and that he inspired through people that he chose throughout history. When we read the word of God, there is absolute power to change our lives as it, as it has changed the whole of humanity. And for me, I think that that uh, picture of those two stones is such a great metaphor, the isotropic and the anisotropic. The isotropic is that one that when it, when it sees the, the pure light of God, it reflects darkness. And uh, for me, that is one day when we get to heaven and we are faced with the pure light of God. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, if Christ is within us, then it's like we have that capacity to reflect the goodness of God back to Him. And our life reflects all of those beautiful colors, and there is a space and a place for us in heaven. But if we are isotropic and we don't have the Holy Spirit in us, if we don't have Christ in us, then one day when the pure light of the Father hits us, um, it's not going to reflect His goodness back to Him. And there will be no space for us in heaven because all that will be left inside of us is a darkness and a, and a space without the light of Christ. Um, so I really trust, as I said, there's something more than is, that is needed than an intellectual argument. There's something more than is needed than even a demonstration of miracles and the supernatural. What is needed is for us to actually open up our hearts to God, to open up our hearts to His Spirit and allow Him to work 
you know. So maybe we can just close our eyes together, and I want to end by praying for us. But I do just once again, last week we had an amazing moment where uh, there was an invitation to people to receive Christ in them, to receive the Holy Spirit, and uh, to commit their lives to following Him, and, and a number of people raised their hands to accept Christ. And before we move on, I want to make that invitation, the invitation of Isaiah 55, open again this morning. So if that is you, if you want to accept Christ this morning, why don't you just raise your hand? If you want to recommit your heart and your life to Christ this morning, why don't you just indicate that to me? Thank you. Thank you, guys. I see that. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray for us. Father God, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that we cannot deny your power in this earth and in creation. We cannot deny, Father God, when we look at your word, that this is not from you and that there is power in this word to change and to transform our lives, Lord. So for those who have raised their hands, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you fall upon them right now. Holy Spirit, would you help them to be your disciples, to walk with you, to follow you wherever you go. Would you fill them uh, with the Holy Spirit? And would you place your mark upon them? And would you write their names in the Lamb's Book of Life as they commit themselves to you, as they take themselves off of the throne of their own lives and put you on the throne? And for the rest of us, Father, I pray that your word would come alive again to us. How often have we cast your word aside like it's just some ordinary book? Would you give us a fresh revelation of the power of your word and the truth that it contains? I pray, Jesus, that this week the word of God would come alive to us, would change and transform us, and would not return void. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Um, one last announcement. So for those, maybe last week if you rose your, ra raised your hand, and this week, uh, in the Bible when people decided to follow Christ, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and in water. So if that's something that you want, please come and speak to me afterwards. And not this coming week, but the 18th, so next weekend, on that Sunday, we want to have an opportunity to baptize some people after the service here at church. So if you would like to be baptized in two weeks' time, or if you know of someone who would like to be baptized, or if you've made a commitment this morning or last week and you've never been baptized, then also please come speak to me. We would love to baptize you two weeks' time as a community. Great.